saints, church, believers, unbelievers, whoever it is, I'm Pam Gunderson, host of You and Him Ministries, and I am excited to tell you, <laughs> I am so excited about the book of Matthew, specifically chapter 24. Let's go ahead and pray ourselves in, and I will tell you why I am excited. Lord, I just lift you up right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I give you all the glory and all the praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glory, glory, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God, that you reveal to your people truths deep truths that have been hidden from those who don't believe. But Lord, we're disciples of your word. That is what is happening with you in Him Ministries, and I am so grateful to finally be able to be a disciple, to look at your word through truth, through the Holy Spirit in me and repent of the lost days and ask that you help with the catch-up, that you will restore the days that the caterpillar has stolen. Lord, I bless each and every person, Father God, that is on this video today and in the future that they'll be preserved for those people who need knowledge and how to get through what's coming upon the earth, specifically the left behind during tribulation. You are the restorer. You are everything to me, Lord. You cover my head in times of trouble, and I ask that you cover the heads and restore faith in the ones that are watching today, Lord God. And Lord, that they, that you will bless them for bearing with someone who is a student and doesn't know anything unless you reveal it through your prophetic word, Father God. I give you all the glory and we say amen and amen. And Lord, that you would bless these readings you would open our spiritual ears and eyes, Father God, that you'll be with each and every person as they walk through this chapter of Matthew 24. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. I'll tell you why I'm excited. I was one that... I read the scriptures from time to time if something in particular interested me, but I was not studying. I would use the Bible apologetically, and what I mean by that is I would hear something from the pulpit, and I would go to the Bible to either prove them right or prove them wrong. But interestingly enough, if you're like me, you got the milk, but never any meat from most of the pastors in the pulpit. They were not studying themselves to be approved. They were watering down and giving milk because they made the statement on many occasions, these people, this congregation, they wouldn't be able to stand a lot of scripture and a lot of study. Let them do that someplace else. And that's pretty much what's going on today. Watered down word. But what we're reading today in Matthew, starting with verse 40, is very eye-opening. Maybe like me, you thought that the rapture was uh, in I'll tell you in particular, let's just go ahead and start reading, and I will point it out to you as I go along here, because my eyes have been jerked open over the last 24 hours, because I never looked at this this way. Um, first, let's look at uh, Vernon uh, McGee's reading of these 
of this particular verse. Uh, we're going to start with verse 40. Now, we had already said that uh, the people in verse 39 were living as though God did not exist. They did not believe that he would judge them and scorned the warning that a flood was imminent and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This has something to do with verse 40 and 41. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Matthew 24, 40 through 41. When I read that, I just assumed that that was the rapture, that one person was going to be taken up in the clouds in the rapture, and that the other person who was evil was going to be left. I truly believed that was what it was. No one told me anything different, and if they did, I must have been asleep in the light, as Isaiah says in... Oh, I think it's 59 verses 9 through 10. Let's take a look at that. Pretty sure that's what that was. And, of course, I would just go ahead and sleep in the light because it's easier to do than to have to actually do some work and find out for yourself exactly what it is that's going on. And let's just go ahead and read that to you. Um, so it is, I can find it, yes, Isaiah 51, 9 through 10. Awake, awake, the arm of the Lord, clothe yourself with strength. Awake, as in days gone by, as in generations of old, was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced that monster through? Verse 10, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? Who might that be? That would be the Lord. But we sleep in church and we just go and we listen to the pastor go on and on and wax wonderful and entertains us. But if we truly will look and dig into the scriptures, we will find out that there's more going on than what the pastor is telling us. There are some good pastors out there, but for the most part, what I'm seeing today, they're just feeding milk. They're just going along as if that's all the sheep need. And Vernon McGee says, I can hear someone saying to me, well, preacher, you have finally painted yourself into a corner. You said the church and the rapture are not in the Olivet Discourse, but here they are. Two shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Well, my friend, he says, Jesus still is not talking about the rapture. After all, what is our Lord talking about here? He already said in the passage before, as the days of Noah were, who was taken away in the days of Noah? They knew not until the flood came and took them all away. They perished in the flood. This is not referring to the rapture when the church will be taken out of the world. Rather, this pictures the removing from the earth by judgment those who are not going to enter the millennial kingdom. In verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Watch is the important word in this passage, and it has a little different meaning from the watching that the child of God does now in waiting for the rapture. Today we have a comforting hope. In that future day, it will be watching with fear and anxiety. In the night, they will say, would to God it were morning. And in the morning, they will say, would to God it were evening. Today, we are to wait and long for his coming. 
In that future day, they will watch with anxiety for his return. You may think, says Vernon McGee, that I am splitting hairs, but he says I'm not. He looked up the Greek word for watch and found that it had about eight different meanings. Although in English, we have only one word. It has several different meanings also. The illustration is this by a man who goes hunt deer hunting. Every year, the man goes into the woods to about the same spot. He puts up his camp, and early in the morning, he goes over the hog back on the hill and sits down by the trunk of an old tree and waits. After a while, he hears a noise in the brush and thinks it might be a deer. He lifts his rifle and waits. He is watching for a deer. Two weeks later, you meet the same man down on the main street corner of town, and you see that he's looking intently down the street. You know that he's waiting for someone. You walk up to him and say, who are you watching for? He replies, I'm waiting for my wife. She is 45 minutes late. He is watching for a deer again, D-E-A-R, but it is a different deer, and he is watching in a little different way. Before on the hill, he had his gu deer gun with him, and he sort of wishes he had it with him again. But it is against the law for him to shoot her. But he is wait watching, and watching in a different way, you see. A month or two later, you go to the hospital. You pass the room, you see this man and his wife sitting by the bedside of a little child. The child has a burning fever, and the doctor had told them that the crisis will come about midnight. They're watching, my friend. That is a different type of watching than for a deer or waiting for a wife on the corner. This is watching with anxiety. And think it will be somewhat with the same feeling that they will watch for our Lord's second coming. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore ye also ready. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. That's Matthew 24, 43 through 45. What I'd like to do is I would like to show you what Thomas Ice says on those same passages. And does he agree with J. Vernon, Vernon McGee? Let's see. So, an interpretation of Matthew 40 through 42, 24, 40 through 42. Again, there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. In the early 1970s, probably the most popular song within the Jesus movement was one entitled, I Wish We'd All Been Ready, by Larry Norman. Thomas Ice says he was involved in that movement, and they rarely met when it did not sing, they really rarely met when they did not sing Norman's song. This song about the rapture includes the following lines. A man and his wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns her head. He's gone! I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill. One disappears and one's left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. I remember that song, don't you folks? Well, um, he says he tends to like songs about the rapture and generally like this song. He does not think Matthew 24, 40 through 42 
compared with Luke 20, 17, 34 through 37, is a reference to the rapture. Instead, Christ has in mind his second coming. Let's go ahead and look at Luke 17, 34 through 37. And again, if you want to study along and be able to understand even more and see it with your eyes as well as with your ears, you might ha want to have your Bible with you. If you don't have one, ask for one. I have them. And they're free and no shipping. Just look up at the upper right-hand corner at the end of this video and ask for one. So we're looking for Luke. I believe that's what we're looking for because I've lost my place. Okay. Hello. Luke 17. Luke 17. 34 through 37. The King James Version, which I like the best. And I'm going to turn my phone off because I'm getting alerts here, which I don't need. Even though I love these people. So it says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. That's interesting. Two men in one bed. Might that be saying something? Oh, dear. Remember, this is during tribulation. This isn't now, and this isn't during the millennium. Uh, actually, this might be. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said, said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither and the eagles be gathered together. Aha! Guess what? End of tribulation. Remember... Where the gather, the eagles gather, the vulture eagles, where the Lord says, come and eat, eat of the kings and the horses in the book of Revelation. Interesting. How smart are we getting now? Getting a lot smarter, getting a lot less ignorant. Okay. One will be taking. The illustration used in this parable is straightforward in both examples. There will be a separation where one individual will be taken and the other left behind. Also in context, it is clear that one is a believer and the other is not. This describes a clear separation process. The question related to this passage is who is taken and who is left behind. Those who hold the pre-tribulationism have argued both ways on this issue. Does this refer to the believer being taken and the other believer, uh, unbeliever left behind, or just the reverse? Where the unbeliever is taken away and the believer is left to enter the kingdom, I believe the latter view is the correct. It is the unbeliever who is taken away in judgment. Now, how that works, I do not know, because this is something that nobody really even talks about. Uh, as I says, he's been arguing through Matthew 24, the focus is upon the second coming, while the rapture is nowhere to be found in this passage. In Matthew 24, our Lord is teaching about the events leading up to his return. Tribulation events have already occurred in Matthew 24, 4 through 26, followed by a revelation of his second coming, which is then followed by parables that drive home lessons related to his previous teachings, Matthew 24, 32 through 51. I think it would be inconsistent to introduce parables about the rapture when he has not taught about that event in this passage. Okay, I want to look at what he says in one. Um, so his footnote says, Christ introduces the rapture in the upper room discourse found in John 13 through 17. 
Jesus not only discusses the new truth of the rapture in John 14, verses 1 through 3, but many other things relating to the impending church age. There is an emphasis in the upper room discourse upon Christ's introduction of a number of topics, and he said, and he said, that he said would be expanded upon later when the spirit of the truth would come to the apostles. John 14, verse 26, John 15, verse 26, John 16, verse 7. The result of the later activity of the Holy Spirit is the New Testament epistles, where they were given greater revelation about New Testament truths like the rapture of the church. This is a certain place, as I've just written, uh, read, where having your Bible open where you can stop this video at that point and look at these scriptures. I could do that, but I don't think that would be a very good discipling practice. It might be a good idea for you to read them for yourself. I'm not going to feed milk. I'm going to try to dig deep into these scriptures and give you enough information that you will be able to study, to show your own self, approved, at least for now. If I'm going to have a Sunday school class for five-year-olds to 12-year-olds, then of course we would do it a little bit different, but I believe I'm speaking to adult Christians and believers here. And if it is a child, I still believe that you, sweetheart, are certainly smart enough to have a Bible or some kind of device on your telephone where you can stop this video and look at the scriptures I've just given you. And I'll be more than happy to repeat those back again. And that would be John 13 through 17. And it would be John chapter 14, verse 26, chapter 15, verse 26, chapter 16, verse 7. Okay, let's go back up to here. It is true that when the rapture occurs, there will be a separation of believers from unbelievers when we are snatched away from planet Earth. It is true that somewhere there will be two people together and one is taken while the other is left. However, that is not what is spoken of in Matthew 24. Because of the context, these parables are making points about what Christ taught in Matthew 24, 4 through 31. So the Greek word used in Matthew 24, 40 through 41 is parolambano, made up of the root word lambano, which means to take, receive, and the preposition para, which means alongside of. Thus the meaning of this verb is to take into close association, take to oneself, take with along. Footnote two is, okay, no more, inf no, no more information than just the author of that uh, site that he has given. The only place that could, could be found is where this word is clearly used of the rapture is of Christ's initial disclosure of this mystery in John 14.3 which states, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And since paralambano is not a technical term that has the same meaning in every instant, it instant is instance, it is used in the New Testament. Like any word in any language, usage must be determined by how it is used in a given context. If you have a pastor that is reading out of context so that he can make his own doctrine not according to the Bible and lead you here and there and yonder that is out of context, then he has the ability to actually deceive you. This would apply to, and I will name you, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, actually, I got a letter, and I need to pray about this. I received a letter in the mail, and he says 
My name is Tom. I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and due to the pandemic, we are unable to visit you in person. The Bible subject we are sharing with our neighbors this month is God's Kingdom. Is it a real government? Many people have prayed the Lord's Prayer, found at Matthew 6, verses 9 through 10, which reads in part, Let your kingdom come, let your will place take place as in heaven also on earth. God's kingdom will benefit mankind in ways no human governments can or will ever hope to accomplish, such as end all wars, racial and economic injustices, as well as eliminate sickness and death and bring the earth back to paradise conditions as God had intended in the beginning. If you would like to learn more about God's kingdom and what it will accomplish for the earth and mankind, feel free to look up at the website, jw.org, the official website of Jehovah's Witnesses. You are under no obligation and will not be contacted by anyone. There is a free Bible study course offered, again, with no obligation on your part. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Tom Fitzpatrick. Doesn't that sound sweet? really does. Sounds wonderful. Had he come to my door? Am I going to debate with him? No, because Jehovah's Witnesses is in the Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin, or I think it's Walter Martin. Anyway, the author of Kingdom of the Cults and his daughter has now taken over that site, listed as a cult. Because what they've done is they've gone ahead and rewritten their own little Bible, who they will not give the author of, cites no scholars that we know that are cited in the NIV or the uh, American, um, any of the Bibles that you will see on uh, Blue Letter or um, Bible, any of the things on the Internet. So if they can't give you the name of the author, the person that wrote this little Bible for them, then how are we to believe that they're going along with um, a scripture? How do we know that this is a spirit-filled congregation if they're going to go ahead and they're going to fiddle with the Word of God? Uh, personally, I can't. We also have the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints who have very unbelievable ideas about God's kingdom. It's a cult. Out and out. We had Jonestown over in uh, Guyana. Um, my husband actually had a, um, his dad had a friend who actually went over there and died uh, in that episode. So we know how these cults form. They go out of context. They build their own doctrine. And they don't stay in context. So if you're going to a church where somebody is just pulling a scripture up and talking about it, and they're not reading line by line, precept upon precept, I'd be very concerned that you are actually not being fed the word of God. You're being fed somebody's idea about what they want to say from a pulpit. That is not the word of God. That is not in context. And I would be very leery about it. I've had it happen to me a few times, and it is it's scary. Because you start listening, and you're going, gosh, I heard that last year. Why are we doing, why are we talking about this again? And why is it that I'm hearing from the pulpit things that are not scriptural at all? And when you try to go tell them, and point out the scripture that they are, I'm going to use the word bastardizing, they won't listen to you because they have already made up their mind. They are making God in their own image, and that is a scary thing. They are putting their image of God above scripture and how they want him to be and how they want him to talk and how they want him to do and to perform for them. Sounds hard, doesn't it? But if you've got a God that you've got on strings like a puppet that you want to perform and used to perform in front of your pop, your congregation, I'd run, and I'd run very quickly, or at least hand in your notice. Okay, let's look at 
Sorry. I've been through, if you've seen any of my past videos, you've seen I've been through it. And it was my own stupidity, my own ignorance. I let him do it to me. I can't, I can't complain too much. <laughs> but some of them it happened so quickly, I had no idea what was even going on. Okay. So some have, okay. Do, 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 since, uh, do, 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 do. Some have tried to argue that taken here, oh. Back to this letter, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with this letter. Will it do me any good to debate this guy? How far, how deep is he into it? Is he one of the elders there? Should I go over to um, the address? It's a post office box. Would it do me any good to send a letter? And how far will they rip it up if I tell them the truth? So I'm praying about it. I'm going to keep it sitting on my desk. I started to throw it away immediately. When they come to my door, I just say, I'm sorry, I'm a born-again Christian. If you want to talk about uh, the Bible and not about the one that you have, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Otherwise, no thanks. When the Latter-day Saints come to my home, or I see them milling around Walmart, I've had a couple discussions with them, and they actually believe they should be working themselves into heaven. They're going to, by their works, they're going to get in heaven. They're not, I don't, they want to believe what, the, they're not looking in the scriptures, they're not searching. And this is why it's so dangerous to be going to a church that is not reading line upon line, precept upon precept. If they're not reading the whole chapter and going through it, and they're just talking about their trip to Europe, you've got a problem on your hands. Okay, or their new project. <laughs> Keep your new project in a newsletter, not at the pulpit. Um, let's see. Some have tried to argue that taken here refers to the pre-trib rapture. There is a small minority of pre-tribulationists uh, that see these two verses as a reference to the rapture. Let's go to... Okay, I did find a published pre-tribulationist who says that this passage, this passage refers to both the rapture and the second coming. He called it dual reference. Uh, his name is Alan B. Chick, the pre-tribulation rapture, uh, Denver Accent Books, 1980, pages 231 to 68. You might want to look that up if you want to. Okay, let's go back up here. For example, David L. Cooper said, The dominant idea is that the one who is a child of God will be taken, whereas the one who has never made his peace with the Lord will be left to pass into the Great Tribulation. Footnote 4. Okay, it's just... Uh, David L. Cooper wrote a book called Future Events Revealed, according to Matthew 24 and 25, Los Angeles, published by David L. Cooper in 1935, page 101. Also, Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum, The Footsteps of the Messiah, A Study of the Sequence of Prophetic Events, Revised Edition, Tuslin Tustin, California, Ariel Ministries, 1982, in, and uh, uh, re uh, another second edition, 2002, page 650, A Disciple of Cooper. Okay. So, let's go back here. Okay. Okay. I want to make sure. Okay. I want to stay in context here. Uh, as Louis Barbieri has noted, the Lord was not describing the rapture, for the removal of the church will not be a judgment on the church. 
If this were the rapture, as some commentators affirm, the rapture would have to be post-tribulational, for this event occurs immediately before the Lord's return in glory. Where have we heard any of this before? I'm, I'm like amazed. Maybe you all out there have. I have not. I, I just read Matthew 24 and assumed it was the rapture. Um, let's look at the footnote five. So Louis A. Barbieri Jr. wrote uh, a book called Matthew and John F. Walvoord and Roy B. Zook, The Bible Knowledge Commentary, The New Testament, Wheaton, Victor Books, 1983, page 79. Uh, John F. Walvoord, it's W-A-L-V-O-O-R-D, is um, uh, quite a commentary uh, information person. Um, I see him all the time, especially in, um, uh, was in my, uh, courses when I uh, received my uh, Master's of Divinity. Okay. Uh, I, I, I need to make one uh, statement. You hear Bible scholars. Bible scholars. Bible scholars. Who are, who are these Bible scholars? Not every Bible scholar is born again. A lot of the Bible scholars are arguing against Christ, not for him. So be careful. Uh, make sure you look and see what their vita's is, vita is. Okay, let's go back to this. Uh, some have said that paralambano is only used of positive relations. However, such is not the case. It is used of the Roman soldiers taking Jesus away from the Garden of Gethsemane to the Praetorium and eventual crucifixion. Matthew 27, 27. Let's see if I can get that pulled up. Oh, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered into him the whole band of soldiers. And in John 19, 16, it says, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. It is used of the devil taking Jesus with him to show him all of the kingdoms of this world in Matthew 4, 5, and verse 8. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Okay, and then verse 8. Again, the devil, devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and sheweth him all of the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This verb is also used of the exercised demon returning to the newly swept house and taking with him and taking with it seven other spirits in Matthew 12, verse 45. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, and more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto the, this wicked generation. So, and then Luke eleven twenty six. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So we can see that that word, parablambano, actually that verb is about wicked things and terrible things that are happening. And so that is the verb that is also being used in Matthew 24, 41 through 42. This verb is also used of the exercise. Okay, we already found that true. Stan Toussaint, or Saint, discusses this matter as follows. Is this a description of the rapture of the church or of the taking of the wicked to judgment? Those who take the former position argue that to take, paralambano, the verb used here is to be differentiated from to take. A-I-R-W is the verb used in verse 39. It is asserted that paralambano signifies the act whereby Christ receives his own to himself. However, paralambano is also used in a bad sense in Matthew 4, 
Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. And in John 19, 16, Then delivered he him therefore into them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Does that make sense? Since it is parallel in thought with those who were taken in the judgment of the flood, it is best to refer the verb to those who were taken or for judgment preceding the establishment of the kingdom. The difference in verbs can be accounted for on the basis of accuracy of description. The flood came and swept them all away is a good transition. translation. Interestingly enough, it also says that the angels in the verse that we had read in Matthew, that the angels came and pulled these people out, took them. Now, are we going to have angels pulling us out in the rapture? No. Uh, the best sense of it is we get receive our glorified body, and then we ascend in the clouds. There's no angels pulling Jesus up. The angels are referring to pulling evil out. And it talks about uh, the four winds, those angels that are in Revelation where they are holding the corners of the earth. And God is saying, or the one angel is saying, do no harm. But they're still there. A contextual consideration. For, uh, Thomas I, he's saying the strongest reason to take the separation depicted in this passage as a reference to one's taken away in judgment is the context. It appears that in Matthew 24, 40, 41, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left, 41, two women shall be grinding at the mall, the one shall be taken and the other left, are illustrating that which preceded in Matthew 24, 36 through 39. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering at all of this, because if they're in tribulation, how much joy actually is there in taking of marriage? It'll be evil days. I don't quite, we're being told that there'll be a cashless society and there'll be a one world government and there's where God is actually has been taken out. It'll be someone that they're worshiping in order to be able to get their food in that. So in that area of thought, it does make some sense. But I am just in angst over what I am looking at here, that many people believe that this is the rapture. And according to what we are learning today from biblical scholars who are spirit-filled, born-again Christians, not the scholars of a seminary that are trying to disprove even the Immaculate Conception, these two men, and I will also go back, I think I also want to look at this, um, and I will insert that after I get through with this, because we're already 43 minutes in. So, <clears throat> let's do this. We are, I have to get back into where I am. Um, okay, so verse 39 ends by saying, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Clearly the emphasis in this verse is on unbelievers being taken away in the judgment of the flood. Therefore, verses 40 through 41 drive that point home by giving a couple examples of the coming separation that will occur at the time of judgment. Amo Gabalan notes the following. Two classes were living in Noah's day, the one who were unbelieving, and these were swept away by the divine judgment. The other class was Noah and his house, and he and his own were left and not destroyed by the judgment. Yeah, okay, in the boat, in the ark. It will be so again in the coming of the Son of Man. 
The unbelievers will be taken away in the day of the judgment and wrath. The others will be left on the earth to receive and enjoy the blessings of the coming age and enter into the kingdom, which will then be established. Which reminds us of the verse, had the Lord not shortened those days, there would be no one left. So, parallel passage. Another reason to see Matthew 24, 40 through 41 as illustrating ones who are taken in judgment is the parallel passage found in Luke 17, 24 through 37. For as the lightning that lighteth, lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first... Verse 25, but first must be must he suffer many things and be rejected of his generation. Verse 26, and as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28, likewise... Okay, let me find my place. <laughs> I've lost my place. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But at the same day, Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down and take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. And then remember Noah's uh, Lot's wife and so on and so on. Very interesting. So let's go back to our study here. Uh... And then, okay, there we go. Uh, all of it, 28 through 29, and 34 through 36. Okay. Okay. In a previous section, uh, Luke 17, 26 through 30, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And it's this, pretty much the same verses. Christ speaks of the coming of the Son of Man being just like the days of Noah and Lot. Okay, let's actually uh, pull that one out. Verse 28 of uh, Luke 17, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Verse 29, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So that has to be, if it's revealing the Son of Man, that has got to be the second coming. Because like a thief in the night is the rapture. And so we're just going to be pulled out. Uh, Christ speaks of the coming of the Son of Man being just like the days of Noah and Lot in both illustrations. Again, in uh, Luke 27, 17, 27, they did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So there will be people that uh, will be saved. They'll accept the Lord. They'll be believers. Some of them will be beheaded, I guess, for their belief, and however that's going to work. The flood came and destroyed them all. Luke uh, 28, 29, uh, 17, 28 through 29. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And then it was the same as happened in the days of Lot, and destroyed them all. Emphasis added. Luke 17, 34 through 30, uh, 36 gives three illustrations of the separation of believers and unbelievers, which we've just read. 
uh, which we'll read again. And Luke 17, verse 34 through 36, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. Same thing as in Matthew. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Verse 35, two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Verse 36, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Gives three illustrations of the separation of believers and unbelievers. Then the following question is asked by the disciples. Where, Lord? This question means, where are the unbelievers taken? Jesus answers, wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be. Gathered together. Eagles in this context imply vultures who hover over and scavenge dead corpuses, dead corpuses. Thus, anyone would be able to see where a dead body is because of the vultures hovering above. Revelation 19:17 through 21. And Revelation 19:17 through 21 reads, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. 18. That ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Verse 19. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together. <clears throat> to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received a mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of the burning fire of brimstone, and the remnant were slain, with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So nobody's getting out of here, whether they're an unbeliever or a believer. Nobody's getting out of here and going into soul sleep. That spirit of yours and soul is going to go somewhere. It's either going to go to heaven or stay in the kingdom of God here on earth, or it's going to be thrown into the lake of brimstone. That's simple. Such language clearly supports the notion that the ones taken are removed to judgment. Maranatha. And that is when Jesus comes. So haven't we been alerted today that you who out there have been studying can look at me and go, you silly person that you didn't know this. But when I've read through it before, I honestly believed it was was uh, the rapture. And now I have to ask forgiveness of anyone who I've argued with about this because of my ignorance. So the deal is we cannot apologetically argue for anything out of Scripture unless we absolutely study it and have the Scriptures on which to stand and make our premise. Anyway, it's we're 53 minutes in. I don't like to make these longer than 30 minutes, but this is what it is. And we've done two verses, 40 and 41. Now, is this worth it? To me, it is. So I, this is for me, if for nobody else. But I even had a question asked today about this. And... I said, this is exactly what we're going to be studying today. Anyway, let's pray ourselves out. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you reveal to your servants your word and exactly what's in it and how it is that it's going to be in these last days, Father. We thank you, Father, for opening our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears to the truth. Lord, we have two witnesses that are saying the same thing, Thomas Ice and J. Vernon McGee. And I want to explore, because we can't go any further, one other person that I was looking at. Actually, let me give you the name of that person, because I, now I can uh, get out of this and go into um, 
the other commentary. The other commentary is John Gill's exposition of the entire body, uh, Bible. And uh, let me look here just for one second. Well, then he says, then uh, he's going into verse 2440, then shall two be in the field about their proper business of husbandry, plowing or sowing or any other rural employment. Let's see what he brings out. Uh, okay. But it doesn't say. Uh, he talks about uh, other books saying the same thing, but he's not bringing out anything about. So we're just going to look at him very sparingly. Doesn't say anything at all. Did he not know? Well, we're dealing with the 1600s here. Interestingly enough, boy, now don't, doesn't that tell us about who we should be studying and who we should not be studying? He's giving, and it looks like he's only giving history, but he's not giving commentary on what it actually means for us today. Anyway, Father, we just thank you, and we give you all the glory, and Lord, that you will inspire us to even dig deeper into your word, and to find your word exciting, and fun, and wonderful, and that it is you who is speaking to us out of your word. <clears throat> If there's someone watching this video that would like to accept the Lord Christ as their Savior, just know that he died for each of us individually, that if you were the only one on earth that he uh, died for, that that blood was from the foundation. He was the lamb from the foundation of the world that was um, to come and to uh, screw up the devil's plan, so to speak, that he was going to have sin reign in the world. Uh, there's a whole teaching about why did uh, God not stop Adam and Eve from the apple? Why was the tree in the garden? We have free will, and when he found out uh, what Satan had done, he had to make a plan. He foreknew, yes, but people have free will to do. I don't know what was in God's mindset to have that tree in the garden so that sin did enter the world, but he is God and we're not. Anyway, there are Bibles up at the top if you, if you would like to accept the Lord and start reading the book of John to see who the Word made flesh is, who is Jesus Christ. And if you accept the Lord, be a witness and just tell someone that you've accepted him into your heart, that you now intend to follow Christ. And then we pray that you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, be baptized. So first you're getting saved, then you're getting baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the signs is speaking with other tongues. If you don't, fault, don't fault yourself. Uh, sometimes that doesn't happen right away. And some people don't even take use of it in a prayer language. There are people that just don't. I don't know why, but uh, it can be in a prayer closet. And then read the book of John, which is a great introduction. And if you need a Bible and you don't have one, feel free to call, write, or email, and we will send you one free of charge, no shipping. Anyway, thank you very much as we take our walk through the Bible. And I am going to call it now, You and Him Ministries and Bible Study. We are taking a walk through the Bible. And J. Vernon McGee and Thomas Ice right now are the two sources that we're using. We're using their commentaries because we can feel that we can depend on them to be the Word of God and their following in context. Have a lovely day. I will see you again tomorrow, which will be Saturday the 14th. Don't give up hope about the election. God is picking. He already knows who it is that he wants to be leading this country for another four years. And how he's going to do it usually will be at the last minute. That way we'll know it's God and he will get all the glory, not all our good ideas 
or even Trump's ideas, but that we can stand strong and pray that Trump does not concede until God reveals who it is that he actually is going to keep or take out of the White House. In Jesus' blessed name, and that's the way it kind of works, and that's the way that I see it. God bless, and you have a lovely Melting snow cascading down a creek and Little streams have bigger dreams To soar with ocean spray And build an arching rainbow Reflecting heaven's rays Creator Builder of mountains and painter of stars, Creator, sovereign of seasons and giver of life, Creator, displaying to nations your beauty and mind, open our eyes.